Okay, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm really excited to be able to talk to you guys today about relearning movement. Um, as they said, I am a uh, professor in the neuroscience department and I run a laboratory uh, group at Kennedy Krieger. And what I'm gonna tell you about today is human motor control and an understanding of it such that we can apply this to uh, help rehabilitate people with different kinds of brain lesions. Now I'm just gonna start by telling you the kinds of techniques we use because they're very different than what you've been hearing about so far. In my lab we use 3D motion tracking and reconstruction of movement, uh, so similar to what we see with computer animation. Uh, we use custom training devices including unusual treadmills, uh, robotics, in order to be able to guide movements and also to expose people to learning situations that they don't normally experience. Um, we do neuroimaging studies and look at patients with specific kinds of brain lesions in order to correlate what we see in our behaviors with their brain damage. And we use non-invasive brain stimulation, uh, magnetic brain stimulation as well as electrical brain stimulation in order to try to understand how circuits are changing and also to understand how to augment learning. And then finally, we're using metabolic measurements. So when you retrain movement, an important factor is how much does it cost? How expensive is it to move? And so I'm gonna tell you about some studies of these things today, touching on some of these areas. Um, before I start though, I should tell you, we measure arm movements, hand movements, we study postural control, we study walking. Today I'm gonna focus on walking because we have uh, done a great deal in, in this area. And what I'd like to uh, first uh, impart to you, I want you to appreciate how complicated the system really is. So what I have here, I'm gonna play an animation from one of my colleagues at Stanford, Scott Delp, who's done a lovely job of animating the muscle activity simply in the lower limbs. So you have 600 muscles in your body and a couple hundred bones, 80 joints with lots of degrees of freedom. And you control this without thinking about any of those muscles usually. Uh, you can do amazing things, uh, amazing dexterity, and you can walk without even thinking about it. And it's not on the spinal cord, David. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna talk about walking. So let's look at the animation. The cords here represent different muscles. And muscles are active when they're red, and they're silent when they're blue. And so what I want you to appreciate is um, how this pattern is really rather complicated just for the simple act of level walking on the surface of, uh, uh, on a level surface. If you look here, back in the pelvis, we're gonna zoom in, you can see all these tiny muscles that are activated in this lovely orchestration in order to keep the person upright. And I guarantee you never think about those things. You never think about the muscles that you're using back there in order to control the movement. So the question is, how do you learn to do this in the first place then? If you don't think about it, how do you go about learning these kinds of processes? And so this is what we're studying in the laboratory. Learning is not a unitary process, as has already been mentioned. It occurs due to many different mechanisms and on di many different time scales. And so when you're thinking about training somebody to move and retraining movement, uh, it's very useful to be able to think about different kinds of mechanisms that may be leveraged for one patient group versus another. So we can do things like tell people how to move. And you can tell people how to move, and sometimes they can do a pretty good job of this, and sometimes it's actually very difficult for them to be able to engage the system in order to take advantage of, of a um, declarative means to move. We can um, have people move a lot. We can tell them repeat it over and over and over again. Um, we can reward people for movement and engage probably basal ganglia circuits. We can also adapt uh, people and perturb them in order to force them to learn a new movement in a more unconscious way. And so what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna tell you about some of these adaptation studies and how we've leveraged them to help people with certain brain lesions because we know that this process depends on other parts of the brain. So just to introduce this to you, motor adaptation is a process of motor learning where you make errors. And the errors that you make are, are corrected trial by trial, in this case, step by step, um, this learning doesn't have to be very explicit at all. You may not be able to tell me at all what it is you're doing to learn, but you know that the movement feels better, more fluid, and feels more stable. Um, it's important that we drive this with predictable demands, and this kind of learning can persist uh, over fairly long periods of time. We like to study this in the lab because we can study it on these time scales, minutes, hours, days, and weeks, 
We do less in the months and year time domain because the NIH doesn't tend to fund very, very long-term studies um, these days, although we, uh, we are hoping to be able to do more of that. Okay. How do you study somebody learning a walking pattern? Well, you could study infants or you can do things to their walking pattern to make them have to learn something new. And so in this case, we use a split belt treadmill. This is our treadmill down here. And what you can see is there are two belts. And one leg can walk on one belt, the other on the other belt. We could make one leg walk three times faster than the other. We can make one leg walk forward and the other leg walk backwards. And we can manipulate the speeds in order to make people have to do things that they don't normally do. So I'm going to show you an animation from 3D motion capture data here. Um, this is a healthy control subject walking in the lab. And what you're going to see is normally when you walk on a treadmill, you make even steps and the legs oscillate like a sine wave up and down, that is back and forth, which is shown right here. And you can see that the, the, um, you have nice antiphase movements of the legs. Now, if we start the treadmill again, and in this case we make one leg go three times faster than the other one, you have to adopt a different pattern. And this is what it looks like. So you can see people limp. They take a small step and a big step, a small step and a big step. The legs are no longer in nice antiphase. And one leg is walking actually in front of the other leg. So you're walking with one leg kind of in front and the other one in back. Now, guess what? The nervous system doesn't like this. So if you let people walk on this for 15 minutes and watch a video, do something else, solve a puzzle, talk to one of my students, what you're going to see is they reestablish a symmetric stepping pattern. So the feet are taking symmetric steps. I'll play that again for you. So when the blue's in the front and the yellow's in the front, the steps are even, even though one leg is going three times faster than the other. Now this is really cool because when you go back to the regular old treadmill, what you see is that they have to unlearn this pattern. They limp in the other direction. And people are always surprised, and I can tell them every time, you're going to limp. And they're like, I'm not going to limp but they do. So this is one way we can study learning. And we do so, whoops, and we do so by um, measuring the movements of the legs. Down here is a plot just showing the difference in step length size. Zero means the steps are even, and during this kind of learning, it takes on the order of a couple hundred steps to learn this pattern, and then you have to actively unlearn it when you go back to a regular treadmill. So, I'm going to tell you about three quick experiments that give you an idea of how I think we have to approach these problems in order to make this kind of information useful clinically and to understand how this works. The first is, why would you adapt in the first place? The second is, what exactly are you learning? And the third point I want to make is, is if it's clinically useful and show you some data suggesting it is. So the first is, why adapt? Here you've got our guy. He's walking. He's not falling down. He's limping but he's walking. Why, why should he change it? He's doing a good job. He's not falling. Well, it turns out that when we measure the metabolic cost of that walking pattern, where there's a big asymmetry in the stepping, it's actually rather expensive. So in this study, what we did is we, we used spirometry to measure the metabolic cost of walking, and it turns out that the more you adapt, that's on the x-axis, the more symmetric, symmetric your walking pattern gets, the more you reduce the cost, the less metabolic power it takes for you to walk. And this is incredibly important for walking control because walking is very expensive. So this means that at least at one level, the nervous system cares about this. Uh, we also believe this is a more stable pattern, but this was a, a, a nice result for us to show that indeed, in patients who have asymmetries, their walking pattern may be very expensive for them, which means they can do less of it. Okay, let's talk about what is learned. And this is actually an interesting question, and I want you guys to, to appreciate this because I think it's very important. When you put somebody on a device, like a treadmill, or you put their arms in a robot, and you give them a big perturbation like I showed you, I made one leg go three times faster than the other, what happens is their, their nervous system seems to say, oh, this device perturbed me. I need to learn something about how to move when I'm on this device, okay? So what people seem to be doing is they're learning how to move in the context of the device. So what happens when they go out and walk in the natural world? Well, they're not on the device anymore. They are able to turn that motor pattern off. 
and use a different one. And then when they come back to the device, they can draw it back up again. Now, if we, instead of hitting them with a big perturbation, we give them a gradual perturbation, just barely change the speeds. First of all, people don't notice it until you're almost at the three to one speed. And second, when they get off the treadmill, they continue to use that pattern. And so what happens is that we think they're assigning the credit of, oh, my walking isn't quite right. It must be my motor system that's made it not right versus I'm on this weird thing. It's making me move funny and I have to learn it. And so it's the question of is it me or is it the treadmill? And what we've found is that if you have a gradual perturbation, they transfer the learning to overground walking, natural walking, about 50%. But if you give them an abrupt perturbation of the same magnitude, ultimately, they only transfer about 18% of the learning. So, and it correlates very well with how many errors they make out of their natural pattern. So the point here is very important to remember that when you get on a device in rehab, you have to be careful that you're learning something about your body and not something about the device. I'm gonna now talk to you a little bit about brain areas and how they're important for walking control. Um, we've studied in a series of patients, and I'm gonna show you some examples. Um, we've studied how damage to different parts of the brain actually affect learning. The first thing we find is that people with damage in the cerebellum don't adapt. And here's an example of somebody who Here's the perturbation and they never get better, and here they go right back to where they were before. They don't have these after effects after they, after they walk. So we, we think that this is a cerebellum dependent process, and if we damage any other part of the brain thus far, they still learn. So this is something that's happening subcortically. It's uh, above the spinal cord but below the cerebrum, and adults and children can adapt they can transfer to overground walking and we can leverage this to help train people with walking asymmetries. So an important issue is how would you use such a device to be able to retrain somebody's walking pattern? One notion would be make the device help them correct their movement. Put somebody with a bad walking pattern on the device and then dial in the right pattern so the device helps them to walk more normally. Now, it turns out that that's not a good idea. Instead of fixing their errors for them with the treadmill, what we need to do with our stroke survivors is we need to make them make their errors worse so they learn how to correct them, so we can drive them to correct. So here I'm showing you somebody with an asymmetric step length. Each dot is a step, time is on the x-axis. You can see this person walks with asymmetry when we make them walk fast or slow. Slow is blue here. When we put them on the treadmill, we actually split the treadmill to make this asymmetry much, much worse than it is normally. And they learn how to correct it slowly so that when we go back to our regular treadmill, now they're not walking with an asymmetry, they're walking with symmetry. So we've done this um, for many, many years now, and we've also learned that if we adapt them in the wrong way, they get worse. So in this case, if we ask people to adapt in blue, we can make them better, but the red people get worse because they have the opposite asymmetry. And we also now know that people with stroke can transfer very nicely to overground walking. So this is transfer of stroke survivors to overground walking after we do a, a, just a single session of training. Okay, just to give you an appreciation, I wanna show you one video and then I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up. Um, we, we decided to study the most extreme form of a cerebral lesion that we could on the treadmill, and these are children who've had a hemispherectomy. So they've removed an entire cerebral hemisphere uh, for seizure disorders. So the cerebellum's still intact, it's sitting right here, but this whole hemisphere has been removed. And the question was, can these kids take advantage of this learning? They have a whole cerebral lesion. And the answer is, is definitely yes, which is really nice. Here's a single session. This is a girl who had a hemispherectomy three weeks before this video was made. And what you can see is she limps, and specifically, she has trouble getting her bad leg through. So she vaults or comes up on her toe on her good leg so she can swing through. Does everybody see that? Okay. So we made her limp worse with the treadmill for a little while. This is with the belt split. It's a little harder to see but she's really vaulting, and her nervous system starts to learn a new pattern. After we're done, I'm gonna skip to the post video, and it's the same condition as this now, and what you can see 
is now she can walk with a nice, even, symmetric pattern just after eight minutes of this kind of training. Now, of course, this washes away. Uh, it's not permanent. But we did train her for many, many weeks. And um, this is her walking now. Um, so she looks pretty good. I'd like to think oh, nice. that it was partially the treadmill, but I haven't studied that specifically. But uh, it's always nice to see. You see her arm didn't actually come back, but her walking looks really good. OK. I'll end by telling you that we've done this now over four weeks of training in stroke, and we get people to be, this is the asymmetry that they have, and here's at the end, post-training, overground walking, and we've made them much more symmetric than they were before, which is actually very hard to do, by the way. Regular treadmill training does not do this. Okay, so what I've told you is that um, lots of forms of learning. We would like to take advantage of them to help treat patients. Uh, adaptation is one. We can use it to reduce the cost of walking. We have to understand how to make it transfer well to natural movements. Um, and we know that we can use it over many weeks to help mitigate walking asymmetry and stroke by augmenting their, their problem, their limp, their error. And we're now using non-invasive brain stimulation to try to further augment this process. And I'll just tell you that if black is normal learning, we can use two different polarities of stimulation and either speed or slow this learning subtly. And so we're going to be testing whether over time this kind of intervention coupled with, with our behavioral training works very well. Um, so thank you. And uh, these are the people who do the work in the lab. I have a lot of collaborators who uh, at Hopkins and beyond who are really fantastic. You'll hear from one of them in a minute, John Krakauer. And uh, of course, we re rely heavily on the NIH uh, and uh, our internal sources. Thank you. <laughs>